Do you have a serious long-term health condition? Then make sure you double your defenses this winter with the COVID-19 and flu vaccines. Extra protection is critical as flu and COVID-19 can make you seriously ill. It's safe to have both vaccines at the same time, so don't delay. Do it now. Double your defenses. Get vaccinated. Get protected. Go to nhs.uk to find out more. This is our People podcast telling the stories behind South Tyneside and Sunderland NHS Foundation Trust. Hello and welcome to this episode of Our People podcast. Uh, I'm Fiona Thompson. I, I've got a bit of a new title now, actually. I'm now Media and PR Manager and I'm delighted here to be welcoming both Louise Howe and Lisa Hobbs to this episode where we're going to talk about our call for concern efforts. So, Lisa, why don't you kick us off with uh, explaining a little bit about your background and what your job you have within our trust. Yeah, hello, my name's uh, Lisa Hobbs and I'm one of the critical care outreach nurses at South Tyneside Hospital. Um, I've been here doing this job for the last eight years. Prior to that, I was at Sunderland Hospital um, where I started as a um, critical care nurse on the ICCU there. That was over 20 years ago. So um, 20 years critical care experience and now based at South Tyneside. Brilliant. And uh, Louise, why don't you tell us a little bit about your career so far and what your role involves? So obviously I'm Louise Howe, I'm an outreach nurse, same as Lisa, but I'm based over at Sunderland. Obviously we cover both sites to help each other out and I've worked in ITU prior to working on outreach. So I initially started there about 40 years ago, did my last placement as a student nurse there and then got a job, thankfully, as a uh, Band 5 staff nurse. Then after about five years, I applied for a band six on the unit, got that. Part of that role is to rotate out onto the outreach team to get some experience. Obviously, you have to have like your history taken and things like that. So I did all that, did my rotation, absolutely loved it, and then helped cover the service, you know, absence. And then one of the team members got a secondment, so I ended up covering for them and then it led on to us getting a permanent position. So I've had a permanent position on outreach for the last two years now. And what does the outreach team do? I don't think I've come across you before, so tell us a little bit about, so that everybody who's listening knows a little bit more about what you get involved in. So the outreach team, it's like a safety net of the hospital. We're classed as a safety net mechanism for the hospital. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the outreach team does? So basically the outreach team um, were contactable via a belief system, obviously separate beliefs for South Tyneside and Sunderland, and we're all highly skilled critical care, well most of us have got background in critical care, um, practitioners who've done like extra training and basically any patients that are unwell on the wards that trigger on the news, which is a scoring parameter used to sort of top up the values of blood pressures, heart rates, all of that. Anyone who's scoring a seven or more, the nurse and staff or whoever should contact us to come and review the patient. If the patient's scoring a three in any one parameter, that should trigger a senior review for that patient. Um, Or even if the OBS are absolutely fine and the nurse and staff sometimes just have that Feeling. feeling that there's something not quite right with the patient, that can ring us, give us the information over the phone about the patient and then we'll assess and go and review that patient if it's appropriate. And so we're really talking about very poorly patients? Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. And so the news score as well, explain a little bit more about that because I've seen that in, talked about in news reports, actual news reports, um, and referred to in lots of different things. So what does that involve? What kind of checks do they involve? So the news score is physiological parameters and it gets scored on whether what we class as normal or abnormal. So things like the heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, temperature, level of consciousness all create a score and that score gets totted up and sets out a response from, which is a documentable response, either to contact critical care outreach team if you're scoring a seven or a three in any one parameter. If it's a five, you will contact one of the medical team, or if you have any concern, you will call the outreach team as well. Also, the critical care outreach team respond to uh, medical emergencies, 
on the ward or anywhere around the hospital and also cardiac arrest, part of the cardiac arrest team. We also assist in any emergency intubations or any uh, critical care transfers uh, from the wards. Well, thank you for giving us a bit of insight into the wider work of your group, that's really helpful. But we're here to talk about Call for Concerns, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that and why it was set up. So when I was saying to you, when I came out under outreach, I was covering for someone that went on to do a secondment and that person had actually done some background work into this as part of, their, I think it was their master's degree that they were doing at the time. And they'd got in touch with a critical care nurse consultant from Royal Berkshire Hospital, uh, Mandy O'Donnell, I think she's called, yeah. who'd been looking at some stuff, I think, like over in Australia and places like that, that mainly at the time related to children who became unwell and unfortunately some of them had died. And it was basically looking at how the parents had kind of picked up on the children not being right before any of the medical or nursing staff had and, you know, felt like there was no one that they could raise their concerns to, basically. So she obviously implemented that into the adult population so for adult patients so I think there was like Ryan's rule in Australia, Australia and then there was the Josie King so I think just on the background of sort of incidents that had happened with children that they'd this Mandy had looked at it and thought we need something like this for adults so it was set up in Sunderland initially because it was before we actually merged as trusts yeah. um, and we trialled it on the patients that were discharged from intensive care initially just to see how it went because it was kind of like a, a working project and it went quite well. We had a couple of calls from patients who had been discharged, stepped down to the wards, but mainly I think it was not so much that there was a clinical concern, it was more of a, I've gone from ITU where I've had like a nurse at the end of my bed for the last whatever period of time they'd been there to, you know, having to press buzzers and wait for busy nurses on the wards to come and, you know, sort out whatever they want and whether it was you know, to pass them a drink of water or help them go to the toilet, whatever. And then after going to nursing quality and things like that, they decided to trial it out into the whole trust, which is what we did. And we've had a few calls, but I think up to now, none of them have really been what I would say is a true call for concern. But there's been that, that place to turn to yeah, when you need a bit more support. You know, when you look back at some of the calls that we've had, it's it's most of them have been because, you know, there's just been a, maybe a little bit of a downfall in the communication. They maybe haven't been updated as much as they wanted to, you know, like the families and things. Just want to know progress. Obviously, things slow down on a weekend and things like that in, in the hospitals. It happens everywhere. So, you know, they're just trying to probably try and get us to chase things up a little bit. But I think sometimes it's just a bit of a... Well, it's a safety net. Obviously, if there is someone who's unwell, we would hopefully pick that up and prevent them ending up coming to ITU or worse. Yeah. But then also they feel like they're being listened to and it sometimes just alleviates their stress and things. And like Lisa said earlier, it's, it's, we're just viewed as an added safety net. And I guess you'd rather welcome that call and look into it than somebody sitting there in the dark about something or exactly, worried, exactly. as a patient or a family. Because at the end of the day, like the call for concern is really for us to get involved if someone is unwell and the family are kind of picking them up on that with their intuition or just the fact that they know that person better than anyone else. You know, you could be a nurse and you've, you're have just meeting them that time. You know, if we get called to see a patient, we've never seen them before. That's mm. our first meeting of them. So we don't know what's normal for them, what's not normal. You know, some people it will be acutely confused, but then that you get patients who've got like dementia and then you think is it the dementia is it, are they confused because they're unwell and they've got infection so it's just and the that's family when people know who those know things them, yeah it so, really makes a difference uh -huh. great well that's really useful and i guess for those patients and family members sometimes they just need something explained to them yeah i think that's all it is uh -huh. and it is although it's like i say it's not a clinical concern as such the way we define it on our little checklist here for them to ring us um it's a concern to them as a family or the patient so we you know I think um, it just just preventative provide, as well yeah. isn't it and it's just an extra layer of vigilance um, extra safety net which you know it allows a fresh pair of eyes that's from a neutral team and it's not from a ward team and yeah. it's not from the nursing team 
it's a neutral team that can sort of maybe pick up on any subtle signs of deterioration because yeah. sometimes obviously we, we monitor physiological signs but sometimes those those numbers that we were talking about earlier they sometimes in young fit healthy pers- people they don't change quickly yeah. and yeah. patients the the patients themselves know when they're becoming more unwell without sometimes the signs changing and sometimes the patient's family will pick up on subtle signs as well and as nurses on the ward and doctors sometimes we're not very good at sort of listening to patients saying that they feel unwell because we'll say oh the numbers are fine these are fine this you know just reassurance because the numbers are fine doesn't necessarily mean that things aren't deteriorating so I think just having call for concern where a patient or a relative can call themselves if they do feel like things are deteriorating and not necessarily a ward team has picked that up. I think that's an important extra layer of safety. And I guess that goes into the fact that we know how we feel yeah. and we're best placed to explain how it, but also if yeah. you've got a family member who knows you, you know, <clears throat> knows really well, knows that something isn't quite right, yeah. even though that person seems fine on the outside and yeah. I suppose their scores... And yeah, lot, yeah, lots, of, lots of <clears throat> um, lots of patients have really subtle signs of deterioration, and mm. and and there's lots of times when pa- when patients' relatives will say there's something not quite right. This isn't right, mm. as in um, as in why the whole call for concern was set up in the first place is because family members were saying there's something not right. There's something not right, but um, medical teams was, were saying oh the numbers are fine. This is fine. Mm. So so I think it's just being um, having some way where relatives can express their concerns and the be listened to. Yeah. Quite helpful because this also ties in with Martha's rule which I know is in progress at the moment yeah. and so I've got a little bit of background here which I'm going to read through if that's okay. It's named after Martha Mills who was 13 when she died after development sepsis uh, and this was after an injury when she was on her bike and hurt herself and her uh, mum has been campaigning for this uh, since her uh, sad death. Um, an inquest found that Martha probably would have survived if doctors had identified the warning signs and had transferred her to the intensive care in the hospital where she was being looked after. And Martha's rule has been recommended to the government already um, and this would give patients and their families a legal right to a second opinion. Uh, and this would be offered by a senior clinicians or senior clinician, sorry, in uh, the same hospital if that uh, patient was deteriorating quickly and the family or the patient felt that their concerns were being dismissed. So a lot of that's kind of in keeping with what we're already doing yeah. here. Yes. And obviously I'm sure we're kind of following the progress of that. Yes, definitely. I mean, I think obviously, you know, the whole call for concern for the adult patients came about because of failings with children being unwell and not necessarily in the UK you know in other countries I think Australia America uh, Josie yeah. King was in like one of the most top rated hospitals in America so it was like a massive thing and this is like 20 years ago so this Martha's rule you know it's very sad that 20 years down the line we've still got people potentially dying unnecessarily um, and like all of the parents involved in these children's cases have all known that there was something not right and just not being listened to for whatever reason and we don't always know you know with all the tests all of the technology we do unfortunately still sometimes get things wrong and people do become unwell and things get missed you know we're human at the end of the day but if we can try and prevent that from happening even if it's to one person I know it's a bit of a cliche then that's, you know, one person who survived possibly because of us intervening, you know. And like Lisa was saying earlier, some of the younger patients, I mean, we tend to think as most people are older in hospital, but we do get quite young, sick patients and their parameters for the new score, they like, they compensate. They're like children in a way, they can be fit as a fiddle one minute and then at death store the next and then rally around quite quickly so you could be looking at observations and blood tests and going well that's all right that's all right but they just go off so quickly and that's when instinct and yeah yeah and just being able to say something's not quite right yeah plays a part and so what happens when somebody gets in touch to raise a call for concern so the criteria for um to to activate the call for concern, there's there's three steps. You have to be an adult um, over 18 as part of an inpatient receiving care in one of our hospital wards, or if you're a relative, friend, or carer of an inpatient. 
you have to have genuine concerns that your condition is getting worse or that a loved one seems to be unexpectedly deteriorating. But you also have to have raised your concerns with the ward nurses and the doctors. If you feel that they're not being addressed or recognised properly, then that's when you're going to activate call for concern. So there's a process for people there's to kind a of process. Yeah, follow. So if, for example, you you want to complain about, you, you know, you're not getting satisfaction about food, beds, car park and things like that, that's not the type of things that we would we would then signpost you for. It's about somebody's condition. Yeah. yeah, this is about the patient, either yourself, if you are the patient, or a relative that you feel is deteriorating, you've expressed concern, and you don't feel that you're being listened to. Right, okay. And so what do they need to do? do they, there's, I think there's a couple of phone calls. Yeah, make. so we've both got mobile phones. Obviously, they're not manned phones. So we check them on a regular basis. If Obviously, if we've got any missed calls, we'll go to answer phone, which is generally what's happened. So we would just routinely check through the day when we're not busy seeing other patients. Obviously, if we have any message, we'll check the messages we can go on to V6, obviously access that patient's details, have a little bit of a read, you know, sort of find Do out research. what's going on, yeah. And then obviously we would go to the ward where the patient was and assess them basically, you know, listen to whatever the concern might be and kind of just take it from there. Mm. If it's inappropriate, then we would probably refer on to the more appropriate people or teams, you know, like Lisa was saying, if it's to do with the food, which is why the emphasis is, you know, Ideally, they should speak with the ward staff or sister, charge nurse, and then, mate, you know, there's there's a bit of a pro- process there, but, you know, we appreciate that we will from time to time get people who will just ring us regardless, and, you know, we just have to use our People sometimes just want answers, don't they? Yeah. yeah, and sometimes that's all it is, and you know what, like we were saying, obviously it's, it's a safety thing that we're doing because we want to protect our patients, but then also... It's, it's a satisfaction yeah. process as well. Uh-huh. Patients and relatives will be more satisfied yeah. with the service and the care that they get if they feel like they've been listened yeah. to, even if they have to go to a third party that isn't their ward base yeah. or whatever. Um, so and saying, if they you know, feel like they've been listened to, I think complaints um, yeah, will reduce... Yeah, even if it a complaint, you know? Because that's often when you, when you look at complaints... Nine out of ten times, I would say probably more than every ten times, it's down to lack of communication. communication. So when yeah. you go back through it all, there's always, and that's what it boils yeah. down to. And hopefully we learn from those yeah. instances. And so I know that you've got answer machines, but I guess if somebody feels it was really pressing, they could say, could somebody make contact on your on their behalf? And that would probably set off a process, even though there is a, a phone call to be made. Yeah, so at the moment we've both got, on both sides, there's a mobile number. Oh, it, if... We, we don't carry it round because we have carry our bleep round all the time and we're we can't have phones with us in yeah. certain areas can we yeah. so so at the moment it is just the mobile number but we are moving forward uh, looking at adding on a potentially adding on the bleep yeah. number so that right. they can contact the bleep number if need be and also go through switch if if need be as well because obviously as moving forward i think as things are going i think it it's becoming more apparent that this is yeah. something that needs to be accessed yeah quite quickly, access quickly and I think especially needs to be on the back available. of Martha's rule which you yeah. know we're hearing about in the backgrounds but nothing's actually sort of come through fully yet yeah. to say but and I when mean you, when you're relatively ill uh, yeah. time can just feel yeah. like it's slipped away so quickly as well yeah, yeah. Um, so the call for concern is the adult Martha's rule that'll probably come into play within the next few months so we've kind of already got that service up and running for the adult patients within the trust and hopefully it it's just an added safety net for the patients and gives some patients and relatives a bit reassurance that and you mentioned bleeps as well because we do still yeah. use bleeps pages yeah. as people yeah. might know them in the hospital yes, mm-hmm. there's no there's no escape from the you sound know. of the bleeper in yeah. i think now the department if, if people know they can always just ring the main hospital switchboard and they might just say oh they put be put through the outreach team and they'll just put them through the bleep you know yeah. so yeah. so there's ways of and avenues yeah, if, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. If, if there's anything like that and so without giving any patient details uh, what kind of situations have arisen so far and have led to you being drafted into to take a look i did have one recently actually last week which was from a, a husband of a patient on a ward who was just in a bit of a panic, basically. A wife had been admitted 
and it was a weekend and was in a lot of pain and his wife had expressed on the phone to him that he, she was in a lot of pain and that she'd asked for pain relief and the pain relief hadn't come and she didn't know what to do and she didn't know who else to ask and it didn't come quickly and things like that and I think the husband was just getting a bit frustrated and didn't know what else to do and what else to, to so that call was from was about that really which was really easily resolved when assessed the patient the patient wasn't critically ill wasn't wasn't requiring any higher levels of care but just needed a, a situation solving quite promptly which was done and then it just alleviated the stress for both the patient and the husband so that was more of a, a situation that didn't really warrant a a call, call but for proved concern, that it was quite helpful in a way but proved that it alleviated the stress and it stopped a complaint mm -hmm. uh, which 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 was yeah. which is good and Louise have you had any instances that would be a good example like I was saying earlier none that have actually been you know a genuine genuine call for concern like as in a clinical deterioration where you know you think no this patient's quite sick we, we need to get things sorted and potentially bring them to the intensive care that sort of thing I think a bit like what Lisa's saying it's it's a genuine clinical concern to them and I think just having someone there you know at the end of the phone even if you just sort of speak with them over the phone and you can say oh you know give them some reassurance and then go and show your face show you know that you're interested you listen to what they're saying and, and deal with it you know something like I say it's, it might not be a critical care clinical concern but it's a concern to that person at that time so we just deal with it I mean I, I think the one of the more recent ones I had was a um, patient who it been he was quite unwell actually on the admissions ward, but he wasn't for escalation of care to intensive care for various reasons. And you know, I'd, I'd said to the family, I'll, I'll give you a call for concern card, you know, because ideally he would have come to intensive care. So I said, you know, if you've got any concerns, because I think I was in the next few days, I was like, I'll give you this card, just give us a ring. And then I was on night shift and I checked the phone, I was like, oh, I've got a missed call. And I recognised the voice straight away because obviously I had quite a bit of dealings with them on that day of admission sort of thing. And um, they were quite frantic on the phone, can you please come to the war? So, you know, I went up and basically the patient was, you know, dying basically. They didn't feel like they were comfortable, that sort of thing. And, you know, they'd spoke with the ward nurses and they didn't feel like the pain relief type medications were being given quick enough. You know, I had a look at all that, I spoke with the doctor, see if we could add anything more in, got in touch with the hospice. So I think that was probably a more genuine one. Because I guess because intensive of, care isn't always yeah, the right place, even no. if somebody is, you know, I've had relatives who sadly passed away, but I, intensive care isn't always the right place no, for people. But no. I, I guess as a family member, you feel like everything yeah, should you want be everything being done and they want, you want them to be in the, yeah, the place yeah. with the yeah. most technology and the most staff and the, yeah. the best exactly, care possible. yeah. And, you know, I went up and it, it, a few minutes of me time, basically, reassured with them and, you know, saying if there was anything we could do, which we couldn't, everything was being done that could be done. I think it's just, like you say, when you're on that other side of the fence and... It's totally different, isn't it? You know, um, absolutely. And so, what kind of feedback have I had from family members? But also, I don't know whether our staff have said anything to you about whether how beneficial they found it. Yeah. Well, I think unfortunately, um, obviously, when COVID struck, the call for concern was just obviously there was no relatives or visitors coming into the hospital. So, obviously, we're kind of relaunching it now because you know everything's back up and running as normal pretty much isn't it because this was so, just getting off the ground when yeah um, uh, yeah I mean it had kind of just come it. out the trial period and it had just <clears> been sort of rolled out across the trust so we hadn't really had a chance to promote it or advertise it and then like I say Covid struck so we're just trying to get get back out into it and get it relaunched and let people know that it's there um, and they can use it and I guess yeah. the value is that it exists. I know you were saying sometimes it hasn't been the right avenue, yeah. but the fact it is there means it's I think there. You know, going back to the feedback, because obviously, you know, when it was first trialled on the step downs from intensive care, I think one of the comments um, that one of the patients had said, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And I, I think that pretty much sums yeah. it up. I think that's a really uh, yeah. and good I think, statement. Um, just reiterating to the ward managers that this isn't a, re we're not trying to step on anybody's yeah. toes. I obviously, 
the idea is that patients and relatives speak to the ward first mm. don't come straight to us and hopefully get things sorted out we're not we're not there to to step on anyone's toes yeah because i think initially when my colleague that obviously got this up and running initially she was met with quite a lot of like oh you know you're going to be coming and criticizing what we're doing and like judging us if we've missed something i'm like no no please no. don't say it as I that guess it's as much there to help them as it's it is to anybody else. enhance yeah. and yeah. make sure it's it, it, it's like what we've said all along is it's that added safety net we're not there to criticize or judge we're there to make sure with the patients uh mm. and their families are safe and their concerns are addressed if you know if they need to be I don't know whether you want to give your colleague a shout out to who kind of set it up. I don't know whether they need a bit more. I can do, yes, there. I didn't know what they so uh, Andrea, Andrea Burgess. She's uh, one of the matrons now with her, so that's I was covering her on outreach. That's what she did before she became matron. So she so put the groundwork in. She did all the work, so credit to Andrea. And how how's it developed since she first set it up? So when she first set it up, like you were saying, we we, we just rolled it out on ITU step down patients just to see if we could manage with the workload and then it was rolled out trust wide obviously since the merger so that was only at Sunderland um, since the merger it's now rolled out at South Tyneside as well so that so that's a new thing for South Tyneside mm-hmm. um, so this has only been up and running for maybe a year in South Tyneside and really so this is just the first relaunch to advertise the service a little bit more because of what's because coming think about. about where we were a year ago with the yeah. pandemic you know we still had very oh, different yeah, things in yeah. place and you know it feels like five minutes ago and also a lifetime ago but exactly. I guess this is now the chance where it can <laughs> properly bed in and, and yeah. people will see the posters around the hospital yes yeah. um, and so we'll share stuff on social media and we're going to do yeah. a news piece about this as well so yeah. so at, um, at the moment the posters are all in shared spaces like beside the lifts and outside ward areas hopefully the posters will be inside ward areas soon and the little business cards, cards. Are, business cards are yeah. at main reception just to pick one up when passing and how do you think it'll it'll move on and grow from here? Because I guess you are still just kind of finding your pace, aren't you? Yeah. I think with the implementation of Martha's Law, when that comes about, we're going to have to probably look at whether we need to push the service a little bit further forward, depending on what comes out from that, because I think yeah. there's going to be a little bit added on to the Martha's Law that whether we'll be involved in that or not, I'm not sure. And presumably that'll count for younger patients as well? Yeah, I mean, we are adult trained nurses, so we don't have any paediatric training. We have in the past had one call um, from the parents of a child who was on the paediatric ward, and it was my colleague who took that referral. And, you know, she just went up, spoke with the ward team, and said, you know, I've had this family get in touch with this. I can't help them. I'm not paediatric trained. This is what the issue is. And, you know, that was sorted, end of. But obviously with Martha's uh, rule potentially coming around, we, we don't actually know how that's going to implement and affect us. Obviously, you know, we wouldn't be able to go and physically assess a child because we're not trained. But, you know, maybe that will work alongside that team or just have a, a contact number to, you know, pass off potentially any calls that we might get. So it's kind of wait and see at the moment, isn't yeah, it? I think we're, we're in talks with paediatrics to see yeah. how they're going to implement yeah because you can you can see that as a real area where yeah because there's mm-hmm. nothing parents so formal actually came from that at the moment so we're kind of just still working on waiting and but we're already hopefully same, a little bit ahead of this but there's what definitely going to be yeah. something i would yeah. imagine yeah what happens if somebody has a question over their own care or loved ones if it's happened in the past and i, I don't i don't know how we would say what the past is because i guess sometimes you've got to get in touch within a certain period of time to review things and then it goes back into I guess if you've got questions in the back of your mind what do you do about those I think if it if it's something in the past that's not really where the service is at the moment you can't make a change can you because I think I think not not through us anyway I think because we're trying to pick up any signs of deterioration that's sort of in real time so that's the the referrals that would you know, we would be focusing yeah. on is real-time deterioration to try and pick up and escalate to, escal- uh, to intensive care or to alleviate uh, admission to intensive care. Other concerns and things in the past, but we do have signposts to p- point people in the directions of things like PALS or um, yeah. and things to, to try and look into con- all the concerns. Good, that's useful to know, because yeah. sometimes we do just have concerns in the back of our mind and sometimes you can't quite get past yeah. them and it keeps you awake and yeah. I suppose especially over a, a relation or a, a friend's care and you 
if you can't get past yeah, that well question, that's it's it. hard Sometimes to do. You don't it? think at the time things come afterwards, and then you you know you might start doubting what you should have done or could have yeah. done and all of that. And you know, if we can't help, it's you know we'll we'll, we'll, we'll try and help or we'll find someone that can basically. Yeah, and I guess just to round up, as, as nurses first and foremost, how do you feel this is going to make a difference, and how do you feel it's already making a difference? I just think it's. I've always felt like when when Andrea was doing all the stuff on it, like I was on me on me rotation, you know, to see what outreach was like, and I thought it was a really really good idea. And I think a few people were like, oh, I don't know, it's going to create extra work, and you know how we're gonna. And I said, well, just think of it. If if you're on the other side of the fence, like you know, you might get inappropriate referrals, but you know, it's not going to increase your workload because if it's inappropriate, you would know that from you know probably the first five, ten minutes of the reviewing the phone call and have a look at the patient notes, you know, but you would still go and see that person. It's not going to be a big thing. But imagine if there's that one person that it is really genuine and that are relatives or the patient that are really, really concerned, you go and think, actually, I'm pleased they've rang us because this person's really poorly, <laughs> you know. I think I've always thought it's a brilliant idea and hopefully, you know, we do just keep getting all inappropriate referrals. Yeah, but, but like Louise said before, um, it just takes one 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 yeah. call to make the whole thing worth worthwhile. Yeah. So if you know saving one person or stopping one person to TV rating is is worth the service yeah. being available. And it is again giving people that avenue to. To, to pick things up if they've got worries yeah. and concerns yeah. and they don't feel like they're being listened to because it is sometimes hard to get a nurse or doctor whoever's attention on the ward because it, it is, is. Busy. you know everywhere's so busy and the demands you know people are coming into hospital I think I was watching something on TV the other day where it was a GP and she was like she'd been a GP for like 25 years and she was like the patients that we see now when she was a junior doctor they wouldn't have even like survived six months now people are living for years with loads of chronic health conditions and things and the pressure on the NHS from all of that you know people are a lot sicker when they come into hospital and you know with all the technology all the medicines that we have we, we all know people unfortunately still die and some of them you know could have been prevented you know we know how many people die from sepsis in the UK and you, like for us in the job we do, we just think like, how, how in this day and age does that still happen? But it does. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can prevent anyone dying unnecessarily or becoming critically unwell because, you know, even when people become critically unwell and they come to intensive care and they get better, it's a long haul and it's a struggle for them to get back to their basic function of what they were before they were unwell. So, you know, anything that prevents any of that, I think is nothing but a good thing. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for joining us for this episode of our People Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Check out our other stories. Hit subscribe to keep up with the latest and catch up with what we've been up to on our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram pages. Just search for our name.